Hello, everyone, and welcome to Neotech 2021, the virtual presentation. Um, today, we're going to be discussing HyperQuests, creating engaging experiences for our students. Um, my name is Garth Holman. Um, I am a teacher at Beechwood Middle School, and I'm going to allow my other cohort in crime here, uh, Mr. Link, introduce himself. You want to click the next slide, JC? Hey, everybody. I'm JC Link, uh, also teaching at Beechwood Middle School. I teach sixth grade social studies. Uh, this is my 13th year at this position. So uh, you're going to see a little bit of these hyper quests of how we create them and uh, kind of the method to our madness behind them as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Travis Armstrong. I teach in Dublin City Schools, uh, currently teaching seventh grade. Uh, I think this is my 13th or 14th year teaching. Um, and I'm excited to be part of this group and to be able to talk with you guys today about some hyper quests. So one thing Travis didn't mention, Travis and I tend to team teach every day together over about 150 miles difference. Um, one thing we're going to do is we're going to run through this presentation fairly quickly. So this link will be embedded underneath. So everything you're seeing is clickable. Uh, the refrigerator, you can click and see a variety of student projects. There's a lot to click on. So we do encourage you to go look at the slideshow. So what are hyper quests? And I'll let Mr. Link kind of briefly talk about that on slide three. So uh, most people have heard of HyperDocs uh, created by these three women here, um, but we kind of morph them into our own uh, definition of what they are and, you know, combine the HyperDocs and the WebQuest to uh, come up with these HyperQuests that we use so often in our classes. Um, but essentially, it's just a way for uh, exploration, accidental learning, and just a variety of tools uh, that the students can showcase what their knowledge is um, and you know provide great work uh, for the whole world to see so there's uh, there's many options for them as you'll see in the examples when we get into later uh, but i guess in a, in a nutshell that's our definition of what a hyper quest is travis anything to add Nope, nope, I think we're good. And the only thing I'll say is that last line, it's not really about teaching technology, it's about using technology to teach. So the HyperQuests combine lots of different technologies and give kids autonomy, uh, mastery, and purpose in what they're doing. They're able to create their own. So the difference between a HyperDoc and a HyperQuest, HyperDoc is a Google Doc that you have kids do their work on. A HyperQuest is something more, and that's where we're gonna get to. So our idea of a HyperQuest, You know, so we, we take the HyperQuest and try to look at it as a way for the students to um, create their understanding and to have some ownership within their understanding. So um, our goal isn't just to provide them with this, um, with this doc or this quest for them to use as simply a consumption tool, right? So not just to consume information, but to produce and to create their own version of their of their history or of their information um, moving forward. Does anybody have anything else to add to that or? No, I mean, they can read the, the more detailed description. I think the next slide just talks about giving kids, you know, engagement and purpose and giving them choice. So it really back is to that idea of drive. How do we create, you know, purpose in what the kids are doing? How do we give them autonomy and how they complete their work? And, and how do we make sure there's a legacy or at the end there's meaning to what they're doing, what they're building has meaning. Um, and so that's kind of our idea of a HyperQuest in a nutshell. Yeah, it's all about the student choice and kind of letting them take control of their own learning. As he flipped the switch, I will say this, we kind of always premise this on the idea of like building a house. So the idea is we build the frame as teachers, we provide this, the structure, we provide the standards, the content standards kids need to grasp, but then how they build the house past the frame is up to them. You know, what kind of shingles they use, what kind of siding are they putting on? So they take control of the final product. Uh, you know, it's differentiation by product is really what it becomes. Obviously, the slide we're looking at is talking about a different, a lot of different things you can use. This is not the, an end-all, be-all of lists of things kids can create with, although you will see examples of all of these things, plus much more podcasting, Minecraft, a lot of different things kids build with. Again, another quick slide that um, we'll just comment on as 
as quickly as I can this idea of why we do what we do. I've already mentioned drive three or four times, right? But I think the whole question became, how do we create uh, engaging work for students? And that took us to this constructivist theory that kids have meaning and value when they control the learning and they understand that, that the learning has meaning to them as a person. So we do that through these ideas here, right? And it does change teaching and learning. I think that's the biggest idea that teachers have to grapple with is a change from teaching and learning of being the person who presents the knowledge to a person who guides them, right? More like a coach. In the end, the kids play the game of life. We've already played that game, right? We're preparing them for what comes after our classes, not the end all be all of our class. So to help them prepare to be able to do many skills and to have mastery of the things that are important to them is I think what we're trying to do. Either of you like to add there? Yeah, I think like you you mentioned it that the big the big focus for us is to try and to teach the the students the skills that they are going to need in order to be successful in life. Having them see the value of learning um, through the intrinsic motivation, so like inner inwardly rather than the extrinsic or the motivator of grades being assigned. So the goal is to try to get them to care less about the grade and to care more about them bettering themselves by learning information and working on skills that are going to be helpful and useful for the rest of their lives. Yeah, we're not into the motivation world, right? Motivation is getting you your cup of coffee in the morning, getting you through that first two periods. What we're trying to accomplish is to inspire kids, inspire kids to change the spirit, to, to let them see the potential of what they can actually do and be proud of what they can do and to try new things. So um, you know, that's something we've always talked about too, motivation versus inspiring people. Our real goal is to inspire. Right. It's a lot easier too whenever uh, the students, I, I rarely tell them no. If they have an idea, sure, go ahead, run with it. Let's see what you can produce. And uh, it, it's pretty, pretty impressive the things that they actually end up, their final product, uh, you know, so and JC, if you, if you think about that, that's what we're so often as teachers not willing to do is we're afraid to fail in front of kids. Yet we tell kids failure is fine. It's fine to fail. You know, if you learn from your mistakes, it's fine. That, but yet teachers are totally afraid to see failure. Sometimes when those kids try a project, it doesn't work. And that's OK. That's not the all end all be all of their grade. It's the concept that they persevere, they tried, they pushed through. I've had kids do projects that started at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, they're still not done, right? They just keep like, what I'm thinking of is a kid who wanted to learn coding, right? And he kept learning coding on his own time and trying to build a project for me. He never got it completely finished, but that's kind of the way life is sometimes. You work at something to become good at it and you're never really finished, right? So that's okay, I think. Yeah, the coaching analogy is really uh, useful as well. I think, you know, we can teach them all the skills that they need, but in the end, the kids are the one in the game. You know, you can't play the game for them, and it's up to them to go perform. So that's a good analogy there. All right, so uh, being the sixth grade social studies teacher, here are a few examples you guys can go through um, and check these out. But uh, just a couple of the hyperquests. Um, I made one on economics, one on ancient Greece. I guess if we, um, you know, the, the difference between the hyperdocs and the hyperquest, you know, this is actually a Google doc right here um, that I made. This one is a Google slide. This one is on Google sites. So it doesn't matter what platform you use, as long as you give like many options and uh, allow them to explore as much as possible. I think that's kind of our, our end goal here. But you could just see real quick if I flip through this, you know, I have an intro video on YouTube. I included slideshows. Um, and as we go through these different quests, you know, they get to explore on Google Earth about the geography of ancient Greece <laughs> and then, uh, you know, embedding articles. And then I always come back, you know, to find out really what they learned. And uh, I think that's where Flipgrid is such a great tool because it's like a conversation. Uh, many students are reluctant to write, which uh, we all know. And um, I, I feel that you actually learn what they learn more so from just a conversation with them. Um, but we have Flipgrid, there's Quizlets in here, many embedded articles, videos. They're just uh, almost like the whole kitchen sink, I guess, of the technology used to teach them. You know, we're uh, 
that opening quote that Garth was talking about, you know, we're not just teaching technology. We want them to be, you know, the uh, autonomy to be learning on their own. Uh, so, so many different things, but this is just one example. Um, and you guys can flip through it and click on all these links to see what's going on. Uh, but probably 15 or 20 different useful tools to teach them about one topic and it, it breaks up really breaks up the monotony also one thing in my class uh, that i really aim to do is uh you know if the students walk in and know what we're doing that day i don't feel that i've done you know i like to change things up to to keep it fresh i guess so um but it, and a hyper quest can take on many forms uh, as you well, can see just three examples there let me interrupt you. So, okay, I look at that ancient Greece and I'm a teacher who's never done anything like what we're talking about. I'm overwhelmed. How do you break that up for a kid? How do you make that work what you have there? Kind of sure. maybe talk a little bit about how you're dividing it up, how kids do work. Because I saw three quests, right? Yeah. So is my assumption there are three basic tasks they're trying to accomplish? Right. So I don't know if I have it embedded in here, but I always create a pacing guide. Um, like, okay, day one, here's what we should do. There's quest one, you have two days to do that. And then I'll, you know, check them off as I'm going through or, you know, and that's the easy, easiest part also, you know, just you have access to all of their work. You can see it from wherever. It's not like the students have to be in front of you to grade their work. Um, but yeah, I always provide pacing guides, uh, you know, and goals, like daily goals. And, you know, whenever they come in, I'm like, all right, you know what we're doing. It's, if I give them three or four or five days in class, <clears throat> or whatever it may be. Um, but there are also check checkpoints and check-ins as well. All right. So tell me more now that you said that, tell me more about like your role. How's your role different? Because typically a social studies teacher would be up in front, read from the book. Let's do this. Let's talk, you know, right. maybe we're in groups. What are you doing? One of my favorite things, you know, is usually pre pandemic, they would be sitting in groups and getting ideas from each other, but it's really cool just to sit down next to a student and, watch them work and see what's going on uh you know here's the pacing guide right there just saw it come up so um you know it, it's a relationship builder you get to sit down next to them and chat a little bit and see what they're looking at and you know you can also learn a lot from them also because they find these the the exploration i mean they have the whole world at their fingertips you know by using the internet and you know they can find useful information as well and i always ask them to share that back with me uh, so uh, but that that's a cool thing it allows me more time to you know hang out and i guess mingle while they're working and watch them in their groups well so, i know that oh go ahead travis um the so a couple things just to, to add um so when he's when he's breaking down the the information by different quests that's what um garth referred to earlier as like laying the framework right so like the framework is you need to understand information about the geography of greece and here are a couple tools that are going to kind of help you do that and then they're able to put their own flair on that as they go um the other thing that um jc was was mentioning here was like it being able to free him up to have more conversations and spend more time speaking with students on a more personal um, individual basis um, and i tend to think about like my re my lectures and like my what i would do is lectures and things like that if if i can automate that right if i can automate that automate that or give them that as a recording right a screen recording of a, of a slideshow then that's less time that i'm standing up in front of the room talking to everybody which is far less effective than coming around and having smaller conversations. I would rather have a conversation about content 15 times in the day than do it three times in the day, right? Because if I'm doing it 15, there's a higher probability that the student who's engaged with me through conversation is gonna get more out of it. So it gives you more time to have those conversations with, with the individual students. Well, there's a key point there. When you're lecturing, there's no conversation there's me telling you. So the whole concept is different. Again, it's back to coaching, right? The kid is saying something and you're like, well, maybe a better way to do this is, is B. Maybe this is a way to think about it. So you're not solving every problem. You're trying to encourage them to dig deeper, to think of alternatives, to think of ways to fulfill what the goal is. So, you know, you, you raised a really 
several really good points there. And I think you'll see that what we do at seventh grade builds on these quests, right? So he starts with three quests. That's a way to divide. We tend to call things quests, like, you know, it's like some medieval journey because that's what we're going to next, right, is the medieval quest. So I don't know, uh, Travis, you want to start or you want me to start on this? Um, I'll start real quick, I guess. Um, so this medieval quest is probably, I would I would say this is what I consider to be the, the better example or the best example that we've come up with in the seventh grade world. Um, and we've kind of used it as our model towards other quests. Um, now we've taken it from a website and put them on Google Docs and things. So I guess really what I'm saying is this was the original web quest that, that we had used. Um, and it's broken down into 10 different sections, just like you saw with JC's um, Greece one where he had the different topics. Um, each quest follows, in this case, each quest follows a particular pattern. Right. There's an intro lesson or an intro lecture. Um, actually, JC, do you mind quick clicking on quest one, the fall of Rome for me? Yep. Um, there's an intro lecture. Um, actually, click, click on like quest six. Click, click something in the middle because they all look the same. So it doesn't matter which one we click on. But So but there's either an intro like slideshow, recording lecture, or what we refer to as a computer side chat which is kind of what you're hearing us do now, talking about the information, a quiz, vocabulary terms, and then a set of questions that again are kind of like that framework for the students to, to help guide the students learning. Um, and these are tend to be built around what the standards are asking us to have the students understand. Um, then at the bottom, we've got the blog post, so where they are going to do some sort of creation with the information, um, and we have a, a mastery quiz, and that's the pattern that all these that all these quests follow. And I notice a lot of these links in here. Do they take them to other things, or? Yeah, it's all it's all hyperlinks. So there's all kinds. Scroll back up. Everything is linked. All the information they might need is there. But let's kind of start with two things at the very top, right? You had mentioned the recorded lecture. All of them are done. All the quests have a recorded lecture. So if JC pushes play on that computer side chat, we always start them with music. Um, music is, he's got his volume off so you can't hear it, um, but he's gonna that's get an echo. So that's okay. Yeah. Um, but while they're doing that, they have the self-checking computer side chat questions. So they're literally listening for as a skill. How do you listen to someone, find the information you need from what they're saying? These are automatically self-graded, kicked back to them, so they know, right, from the lecture, did I pick up the key things I need to know? The most important question there is that last one right at the bottom. What are two questions you have about the topic? So now I'm not spending my time telling them that lecture for 15, like, okay, a nine-minute lecture there takes 25 minutes in class, right? You're showing things, you're talking, whatever it may be. I read those last, that last question. What are two questions you have about the content? That helps me direct kids. It also gives me feedback. You can see if kids know the basic information from the first assignment. Now, what we're doing here is very front heavy for a teacher. There's a lot of prep work to do this. But once the kids start the quest, they pretty much work. We adjust ours as a pacing guide. They have one week. We have one class week to do this. So if he goes back to the original document. Do you have a set amount of uh, questions you ask? No, it's based on the lectures. The, the lectures like this one you're looking at is nine minutes and 44 seconds. And okay. they're not lectures. They shouldn't be called that. They're actually chats. So it's either Travis and I, or Travis, Mike Pennington and I, or Anna Love and Travis and I, we have conversations. So it's like they're eavesdropping on three adults talking about a topic. Um, they have humor in them. Uh, if we're recording at home and our dark, our, the dog barks and the kid comes and asks for milk, we leave it in there and just keep going because we don't have time, right? We do the best we can with what we got. And sometimes okay. that adds the most comical piece to the whole thing. Right. Is the kids, yes, they do. They still ask about questions that they'll put things on there. Why was your kid, do you want milk? You know, they'll ask questions about that. We're people too, and they need to know that. Sometimes. Yes. They, Students forget, especially 12, 13 year olds. 
Yeah. All the vocabulary is completed for them, so they can play games with the with the flashcards. There's no there's no like work they have to do. It's there. We need you to become familiar with the words. They're probably not going to use papacy their entire life, right? Maybe they will, but secular might be a word they hear the rest of their life. So they're just ideas that they become familiar with that we know as they do the quest, they're going to come across and continue to work with. But when you go down one more step, it's the next one that's real interesting to me. And that's the D go to the right. It's very, very small. But those are websites saved by kids for kids. So now they're collecting resources and sharing with other kids from Dublin to kids at the high school that have say, hey, Mr. Roman, I found this great link. They'll share it to the Deagle account. And all of a sudden we have access to all kinds of websites that have kids have read, highlighted sometimes. Um, so it's pretty cool because they're now collaborating in this process. So this is, a, in my mind, a, a pretty in-depth endeavor, what they're doing with these quests, right? But this for us is a hyperquest. It's kind of like we're using the technology to expand what kids can do, to give them options about what they do. And when you look at the questions, they're not like Google this and you'll find an answer. They're like find pieces of artwork. What do you notice about three pieces of artwork, right? We give them links to the Cleveland Art Museum to a, 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 a specific display. So they're, they're exploring and thinking for themselves about content. Some of it's reading, some of it's video, you know, YouTube video. But generally, we're trying to get them to explore to, as JC said at the beginning, this idea of accidental learning. They're going to come across things and learn and become interested in things that they didn't even know existed if we were just running the class using a textbook, right? That we're exposing them to much more. Um, what is the end goal here? Are they like creating something? Are they? What I think if we go, again, let me just click to see. I think if we go to the next slide, we can kind of see some of the end results. So this would be where as you as a participant, we're not going to go through every one of these, um, you know, but you can go to authentic writing. I, I think I know where that's going to take us, but although I can't remember. So then what they ultimately built is they have a blog page they're running. This kid is now well beyond 13. But now you see she's doing artwork, right? She's drawing pictures about the medieval quest on, on um, Magna Carta, right? You have to scroll down a little bit because after the quest, we do other things, but there's the Spanish Inquisition. So they're writing historical fiction for us. We do a lot of historical fiction writing in their blog posts. So we're really not back to where we were doing the middle age web quests. You're now in the, the last very end of the year. But this kid liked to write, like to make her own movies, right? And now you're getting back to what was going on in the Middle Ages. So she's producing her own movies. She's making some more, right? They're doing what they want to do to show what they're learning, right? And again, there are, I don't know, I'm looking at that slide. There's probably 15 links on there where you can see different examples of kids' work, right? This is a pretty extensive blog, probably one of the best blogs I've ever seen by a kid. You know, 13, what they were able to produce and build. Um, but all of these are links. One thing to to kind of piggyback or to kind of take a play out of Garth's playbook here, um, it would probably it's probably pretty easy to look at that the middle age web quest and think like, okay, there's no way that I could ever like. Maybe you're thinking that it would be hard to create this website or whatever, um, and and maybe, um, but understand that everything on that on that website that we're using. Um, you could take every bit of that and put it inside of a Google slideshow and then give the kids, have the kids all make a copy of the slideshow and answer the questions as they go. So like your slide one could be the link to an audio recording. And then you could have the, you could have the quiz right there on slide one. Slide two could be the link to the Quizlet or the embed Quizlet. Slide three could be the first question on that question list where you ask them, you give them a link to this website to find an image and then to come back to it. So you could convert all of these things from a web quest to a slideshow used as a web quest, um, or I guess I should be using the term hyper quest, all right? Um, and then you could also take it to a Google Doc and, and transfer it. Like the tool that you use to hand the information to the kids can vary. Yeah, I'll, let me actually I'll have JC do this. Go back to the Students for Tomorrow set. I think you still have it up. Um, okay, scroll down on that page. Keep going. See where it says older version of this quest? Click that. 
this was maybe, this wasn't the first year we did it, but this is what it looked like a long time ago. So just kind of scroll down and you can see the changes. <laughs> it looks very different now. It's like, here's the quest, right? Here's your general resources. We didn't have specific things. And then as you get into the quest, which is right there, the quest looks very different. It was a video and four questions. And then the next quest was the, not a video, but that recording and then some questions. So we've come a long way. You can start with that. Here are a series of questions. Here's some links to use. You are creating a hyperquest. When did you start doing You can think down the road, you can get it to something much more extravagant and much more interesting. What year would you say this original version is from? I think I originally birth, uh, built the first middle age web quest, I think in 2009. Now that says, you know, it's not that date 2002 is not the right date. That's the quote. But I think this is like probably around 2009. Yeah. So a 10-year evolution of, you know, once you have this built, there's always new information and new tools coming out also. Yes. Um, especially post-pandemic. I mean, the technology world has. So to answer what Travis was talking about, that idea that if you look at JC's, it's the same thing. Quest one, two, three. One document. Here are some questions. Here's a video. He was a little more specific. Watch this video, answer this, go to this, answer this, go to this flip grid. So it was more of a structured walkthrough. Ours is a little bit broader, but the kids are getting older, right? So it's a little broader, but yet there is that framework still. You got to know about illuminated manuscripts. You got to know about art. You got to know about relics. But then inside that, what you learn and what you do is, is the basic. As long as you get the idea of what they are, that's what the standards talk about, right? What we do with it is beyond that. And so I think we can click on next slide. We want to end up right about now. We tried to want to keep it under 30. I mean, these are other student examples um, of hyperquests they built, things that might kind of blow you away, but aren't too overwhelming either. I mean, they may seem like a lot, but once you learn how this stuff is kind of done, um, these aren't too bad. But these are all kid created projects, right? So there's a lot of things we're doing that we call hyperquests. So to put it in a shell, HyperQuest is a extensive, it's a project using technology. Let's think about it that way. Versus a HyperDoc is a worksheet using technology becomes a HyperDoc, right? You maybe add some cool stuff to the worksheet, but it's still a worksheet. This is a project, but it's just using a lot of technology. And the, the technology for me is ubiquitous with what we're doing. We're not teaching technology. We're teaching content. And they're using technology to be able to explore and find things that we couldn't do in a normal classroom. The use, of the, technology, the use of the technology might be one of the best examples of the skill, right? So if you think about you being able to like know how to format a document on Microsoft Word, right? Once you have that skill, you can take that skill and apply it to other things, right? So Google Docs kind of works off of the same premise, right? So once you have the students understand a skill of one of these technologies, that skill is transferable typically from one program to another, just like it is for, just like it is for you, right? PowerPoint to, to Google Slides, not a huge, not a huge learning curve for you. Yes, yeah, some things are different, but it's a lot easier to understand one thing once you, once you know the, another one that's similar to it. And so I think at this point, that was, a, that was a good point, Travis. Thanks for sharing that. I think with the last thing, we'll just run through these last like six slides, maybe two minutes uh, total, just going through them. You know, this is kind of that portrait of a, a graduate and what you hope kids can do. And I think what we're talking about is getting kids to do that at seventh grade. We're seeing kids in sixth and seventh grade demonstrate independence, you know, strong content knowledge. Um, you know, so I think we're doing all those things already. Right, in the end, our hyperquests are adding this idea of autonomy, mastery, and purpose back to drive. We're giving kids a reason. They get to decide, they get to build, they see value in their work, right? And there's a big difference between turning a piece of paper in that's good enough for me and turning in something that the world can see. Those are two different things. Yeah, and kids whenever they put more effort into it. Right, whenever they first learn that in my class, I think, you know, I start exposing them uh, we do a, one of the map um, map projects, and I, I'll just put it on Twitter. And I mean, I show them. Well, I'm, this is not just me doing it. I'll take a good example. And 120,000 people 
have viewed, you know, view their work. So it kind of blows them away when they're 11 and 12 years old. Right. You know, so well, I'm going to point right here to this picture, right where it says, what is next? I know I'm the one recording, so they'll see my cursor. That is actually from that girl's blog, that picture. That's she scanned those and we framed them. So her legacy lives on in our room and the kids see that. And then they, I mean, we're using most of what they're using to learn from is stuff created by kids that came two years ago, five years ago, eight years ago, right? They're using each other's videos. They're finding each other's websites and building off each other. It's, it's pretty cool. There is true collaborative work going on and it does give kids purpose. And the whole thing you want to have inspiring also, you know, to see their work here. I mean, students come back or 20 well, years old now. They can Even see the next right picture here. shows that, right? Our legacy wall in our building, right? Okay. Where there's projects out that can be QR coded and people can scan. And the idea is that they walk through and they're seeing projects that kids made five or six years ago on a wall forever in the hallway. So we built a, a project-based timeline that kids can scan with their QR. Now I know JC, you have the kids go out with their Chromebook every year and scan those projects and start looking at what kids were building in the middle school so from the very beginning, they're thinking about what do I do to leave a legacy for others? Yeah. And I think that's where HyperQuest come in. Right. We Sibling rivalry is pretty funny also because like, oh, that's my older brother. You know, he was in seventh grade four years ago and I'm going to I'm going to do something better than that. So. so again, we're going to end it up with that. The last slide just has our contact. Um, again, my name is Garth Holman and I can be found at, at Garth Holman on, on Twitter. JC is at J is it JC link or just JC link? link? Yes. JC link on Twitter and Travis, you do yours. Cause I'm not sure. Cause it changed. Um, mine is T Armstrong 614. So 614 cause he's in the C bus down in Columbus. Okay. If you do have any questions, you can also email us. That would be Garth at teachers for tomorrow, JC at teachers for tomorrow or Travis at teachers for tomorrow. We will respond. Um, we can send you links. Yeah, our stuff is all open house. So if you want to use one of our projects as a base to just see how it plays out, we're more than happy to supply you with links to let you do that. Um, it is kind of weird to get tweets with kids listening to my voice in a different state, but it's kind of cool at the same time. So hopefully. Anything you guys want to say? Um, just check out the website. Um, as you mentioned, he, he mentioned teachersfortomorrow.net. Um, that's where you can find um, a ton of blogs that we've written, um, links to previous presentations and our contact information. Yeah, many years of work on there. All right, well, thank you for joining us and have a great uh, rest of Neotech Conference.